I'm Diana Silva, also known as Molly Mama. First of all, I want to welcome all of you for joining us today for this conversation about grief on Mother's Day. And I just want to give you a virtual hug because I assume that if you're here, you're one of us that has lost their mothers and it's especially a tough day for us. So thank you for joining and I hope that we can offer you some comfort to help you understand that you're not alone in this journey and also give you some tips that might be helpful as you experience and learn to live with your grief. I also wanna welcome my co-host, Ms. Melissa Caprio. She is an author. She's written a book called Postcards to the Universe. She's here, she's gonna join in the conversation and actually kind of interview me. And then at the end of today, she's going to be leading us in an art project to help us reconnect with our mamas in heaven. And so with that, I wanna welcome Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this. I so appreciate it. So I'm going to start, and I just want to read a little um, small bio on you for people who are finding you for the first time. Okay, one second before you do that. I almost I forgot some, okay. some just housekeeping things because I'm like a little bit nervous. But I just want to, for everybody that is here, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat and we are happy to answer them as we go along. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. I love questions. Okay. So thank you. My name is Melissa Caprio and I'm a photographer and an author and my book came out in November of 2019 called Postcards to the Universe, a global movement for manifestation. So I'm super happy to be a part of this with Diana. So like I said, I, I I want to um, just read a small bio on Diana uh, so that you guys that have joined us today are familiar with her and her background. So Diana Silva is a San Diego based home chef, a video blogger and a podcaster. Her Mole Mama Recipes YouTube channel celebrates family recipes, cooking delicious meals at home and adding love to every recipe. Diving into her Latina roots, she uses her magical mocajete and other tools and techniques that make her food taste like grandma used to make back in Mexico. Along with her guest chefs, Diana explores recipes and traditions from all over the world and the stories that keep them alive. Diana is calling everyone to return to their kitchens and to preserve their living and past ancestors' favorite recipes and stories for future generations. We need to try to preserve our cultures and not just let those favorite recipes disappear forever. The common thread of every cherished family recipe is that we were that they were homemade with love, and that's the real secret ingredient, says Diana. For many home chefs, cooking is their preferred love language, and that's why we cherish their recipes. Their love has the power to transcend any ordinary recipe into magic. Diana encourages everyone to preserve those precious recipes and the stories that make them unique. She invites those whose recipes have been lost or have faded over time to subscribe to her YouTube channel. There are plenty of recipes and traditions to share, and you just might be inspired to create your own because, quote, every recipe tells a story. Many of the recipes in, the, in this book are on her YouTube channel. She has created a book also and called Mole Mama, Cooking with Love. And we're going to talk about the book um, a, a little bit in a little bit. But I just wanted people who, for the first time, Diana, who are meeting you today, know a little bit about your background. So why don't you share a little bit with our audience about your relationship with your mama? Thank you so much, Melissa. So I want to introduce everyone to my mother, Rose. Mm, Here Rose. she is, my mama. Um, Rosie is my dad used to call her. But she has been gone now um, for eight years. And she was my absolute best friend. So we had a really great relationship. I grew up on a farm, on a dairy farm in California. So we didn't have, I didn't have a lot of friends that lived nearby, so we had a big family, but I was really close to my mom and the way that we connected was through food and through our cooking. 
And she's um, been gone now for eight years and she is the inspiration for Mole Mama. So everything that Melissa mentioned, it's all because of her that I have created all of it. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that Mother's Day is, is especially hard for me. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you and to talk about what I've gone through because my birthday is tomorrow. And so my birthday and Mother's Day, when my mother was alive, were always celebrated together. So those first few Mother's Days were specifically really, really tough because it was just a reminder that we, we would just do this combined celebration and it was, you know, she's no longer here. So, but she was an amazing person. She had a heart of gold. People just loved, loved, loved my mother. And um, when she was really sick um, and dying is when I really perfected her recipe. So we'll talk about more about that later too. Yeah. And I've had the privilege of trying some of those recipes <laughs> and I can <laughs> attest that Diana is an amazing cook. So whatever magic you're channeling from your mom <laughs> definitely comes through because I've never had Mexican food like that in my life. So yeah, I, I appreciate that. So thank you. And I want to wish you a happy early birthday. Thank you. That's right. Your birthday is tomorrow. So why don't you, um, I want to talk about your mom. Um, she was sick. I mean, you have a really unique story. Your mom was sick for a long time and you said she died eight years ago. So can you like share with us a little bit about what happened um, with your mom when she got sick? Cause that is a big part of why you wrote the book. Right. So uh, my mother had COPD and congestive heart disease. So two diseases that are really debilitating and she was in the hospital and they told us that she had three days to live. So she went into hospice. We got the house ready to bring her home. We wanted her to die at home. And during that time, my mother held on for 13 months. So it was during that time that I actually got to perfect her recipes because she was such an amazing cook and she didn't want to eat anybody else's food. She wanted to eat her food. And because food was our love language, I wanted her, you know, every time I wanted her to experience that food before she left. So anything that she wanted, I was going to try to make. And when we cooked together, and even when I didn't live in the same place as her, I'd always be able to call her and go, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? So it was when she was in her hospital bed that I was able to actually perfect those recipes and she would taste test because she couldn't come into the kitchen and put some more caminos or cloves or chili powder in a dish when I wasn't in the room because that's what she'd always done because none of the recipes were written down. <laughs> so that's how I was able to perfect it. But her disease and illness left her um, completely in a hospital bed bedridden and she had to wear a mask um, a lot to get rid of the excess CO2 that was built up in her body. So just the symptoms that she went through and the suffering that I saw was really hard. It was really, really hard to see. And um, it was a four hour drive from where I was living. So I spent, during those 13 months, I made 40 trips to see her where I would cook the food for the weekend. And I would call, you know, beforehand and go, okay, what are you craving? Is it enchiladas this week? Or do you want some mole? Do you want some pasole? Do you want some, you know, barbecue shirt? What do you want? So whatever she wanted, I would run to the market in my hometown and then drive and then cook for her all weekend. And I think that um, it was amazing just to see how somebody that was so incredibly ill could still be so present and still laugh and find contentment and find joy. So it, it was an amazing experience. And I thought that because I was driving four hours to see her and I would try to pump myself up during that time to be like, okay, you gotta be positive. You gotta be in, walk in there and be joyful and have a big smile on your face. Even if she's lost more weight, even if she's struggling to breathe, if she's coughing up blood, you gotta just be strong and not let, not let her see her, you fall apart. And then I would drive home for those four hours and basically cry. I would just bawl my eyes out. 
And so I had this thought that when she was going to die, when she was, you know, finally, when the suffering was going to end for her, that I would have grieved it already. And especially as time went on, because as, as it just kept going and we were like, she's still here. And, um, but when she died, the grief that I experienced then was nothing like I had experienced when she was alive. I had no idea. And I had lost other people. So it wasn't the, the first time that, you know, I had lost somebody. My father had died many years before and I'd lost my grandfather and other mm -hmm. people. But, but there was something just crushing to my spirit, to my heart when I lost her. Yeah, there's something about our mothers that's different. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a difficult relationship, I think, there's something about the mother, daughter, especially relationship that's different. I don't know. Yeah, so I can, I can totally understand that. And before we talk about um, the grief and when she, after she passed, while she was alive and she was sitting in the bed. Now she was in the living room, right? Where you were cooking for her, like, and it was right off the kitchen because she yes. couldn't, was her house an upstairs, downstairs house? No, it was a bed. single level. Yeah. Okay. So she was just in the main room. Right. And then share a little bit because you have a, I mean, you have told me some stories about your family and how many people you talked, you even mentioned how many people loved your mama Rose, right? So how many people would come and like, I mean, this is a big deal. You had two small children at home at the time also, right? Your boys were at home still. Yes, I did. Yeah, so you're leaving your own children to go take care of your mom in California traffic. Yes. <laughs> I know California traffic because I've been in it. Um, so you're doing this every weekend while you're working full time and you have your, your small children. So everybody would come over, right? Like, and sample the food and surround her in the bed. So she was filled with a lot of love. So can you share a little bit about like what that experience was like for her and for you? Yes, my, my mother was beloved. And when I wrote her obituary, I think I listed either 12 or 15 people at, as her children, even though she gave birth to three of us <laughs> because <laughs> she was so beloved and she just adopted everyone. And as you said, Melissa, when um, she was so sick and I would do the cooking, there would be, our, the house would be filled. People would just be coming by all the time to see her. And it was just so lovely. And the way that she greeted them and, you know, just was wanted to hear what they had to say. And she had a way of making you feel like anybody that spoke to her, like she was the most, you were the most important person in the world. And all of her hospice team fell in love with my mother. Mm -hmm. And even when she passed, like they all came to the house and I guess you're only supposed to have one of them there and they were all there and, and they're like, we're, we're breaking rules, but we had to come. We love your mother. Yeah. And that's just who she was. She had this ability to make you feel so beloved and so special and so welcome that even from a hospital bed, she was able to do that. Oh, I love that. Well, you talk a lot about that and, and Diana talks a lot about that in her book. Um, you know, certain experiences and you go by dates. If I remember, there's like dates in the book about what was going on that day, which is really, it's a really good timeline because um, 13 months is a long time to be in hospice, isn't it? It is. They tried to um, kick her out twice because <laughs> it's, it's a six month thing. And um, oh, wow. yeah, you're supposed to be in it for six months. And then they actually like, they, they tried to, they tried to, kick her out. But both times when she was evaluated by the doctors are like, we don't even know why she's still alive. And my mom was really motivated to stay alive because my niece was expecting her first great grandchild. And my mother decided that she was going to stick it out to meet this granddaughter of hers, great granddaughter. Aww. Yeah. Well, so sweet. So um, at the end, I'm assuming your mom got more sick and you, did you know it was coming? Cause I know originally she was given three days and then she lived 13 months. So did you know at the end that it was coming or were you not, were you taken by surprise? I knew it was coming. I mean, okay. it, she, she was just getting more and more thin and frail and um, it, it was, a little bit of a shock the day that it happened because mm -hmm. 
um, I had spent the night I was there and um, I had slept next to her, which I always did. Mm. And, you know, after I woke up in the morning and she'd been really restless and she was really quiet. And so I told my sister and I was like, oh, she had a good night. She didn't wake up. She's good. And my sister is an RN. And my sister went and looked at her and she's like, oh my gosh, it's going to be a couple of hours. She had the death rattle, I guess. And I, oh. I didn't know what that was. So I was a little bit surprised, yeah. but um, it was really beautiful because so many of her children and family we were with her when she passed. We were all around her. So she was not alone. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that you got to be with her and everybody was around her. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so obviously when she passed, I mean, like you said, you thought that you could grieve during it, but it was nothing until she passed. So how did you feel um, after she died? I was numb. I just remember being so incredible numb mm -hmm. and the quiet. Mm. Like I, you know, and I'd experienced the quiet, the death quiet before right. I lost a really dear friend, but it was that quiet. And it was that for me, cause I'd called her every day. It was like picking this mm. thing up and mm. looking at her number and going, Oh my God, I can't call yeah. her. That, that was just, and I remember trying to hide a lot of my grief because as you mentioned, my kids are fairly young. They were super close to their grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to just kind of hide it and suck it up and suck it up to go back to work and then cry privately and, you know, but mm -hmm. I was numb. I was completely numb and I was in a fog really mm. in a fog and depressed, terribly depressed. Yeah. Yeah, it must be. I mean, it must have been just devastating, even though you know. Like, I don't, I don't think there is, you know, I've heard people, some people who have lost their mothers quickly and said that they wish they've had more time, and then other people who have had to deal with long illnesses. And I don't think, I mean, and personally, I don't think that there is a good way to lose your mother. There's just no. not. You know, because no. your mom is, I don't care how old you are, right? Your mom is like, you still feel like a little girl, like it's your mom, right? You could be 70 years old and have a 90 year old mother and it's still your mom. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, I've told so many of my friends, this is that no matter how long you have, it's never long enough, as you were saying. And my mother was 84 and I was like, yeah, it wasn't enough. And I know that sounds really greedy, but I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think that um, we're really wired for a separation from our mothers. Like yeah. I just don't think as humans that it's, it's a really painful road to have to go down. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, um, you, you said you were feeling numb at first. Do you, do you know how long the numbness stayed with you? Months. Nice. It was months, Melissa. And I think what happened was there's a couple things that, that really helped me. Mm -hmm. Was um, I used to have nightmares when she first passed. I and mean, this is going to sound terrible. But I had these nightmares that we had buried her and she was still alive. Oh my God. It was horrible. And yeah. I would wake up crying and upset yeah. and I'm like, Oh my God, we, how did we do that to her? And, and, um, you know, I'd wake up crying and screaming and, um, my husband, he would listen to all of this and he was like, you know, is there a way for you to start thinking more pleasant thoughts of your mother? Because mm -hmm. she was 84. She was sick for, you know, a year and a half and it was really, really bad. But can you think beyond this year and a half that was so horrible. Sure. And so I think that really started helping me is to, you know, when I would wake up and I'd have these nightmares, I would allow myself to kind of feel it. And I was doing meditation and yoga mm -hmm. and I started doing a whole bunch of other things to try to help me get out of my grief or got not get out of my grief, but live with my grief. Cause I think it stays with us forever. Yeah. Um, but I think 
when I would have these thoughts, I would be like, okay, I've just had another horrible dream or I've just remembered her not being able to breathe. But then I'd be like, okay, what positive thing can I remember? You know? And so then I would also replace it or kind of give it some balance. And that really helped me if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that makes, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, um, like, so you had to get used to a new normal because your normal for 13 months was driving four hours, cooking for your mom, seeing on your family over there and the friends that came over. And so then you go back to your life, right? You're there again with your boys and your husband and your work. So how was that going back to your normal, um, you know, your new normal? That was also really challenging because yeah. it was, I was just numb through all of it. Like, I feel like I wasn't a very good mom because I wasn't present. Like that yeah. ability to be present, I was just so lost in my own grief. Mm -hmm. It was, it was really, really tough. And, um, I think the other thing that really helped me was I, I don't know where I had read it or picked it up, but there was something that I'd read about getting your grief out of you, like expressing yeah. it somehow. And so I remember like going to, I grew up on a farm, so I'm really, there's something about dirt in me. It's like very comforting. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I, I remember going to an empty field and just screaming, mm. just screaming and giving myself, I know that sounds crazy, but just giving myself permission to just mm -hmm. like let this, you know, hurt and this pain just come out of my body because it really does, I think, connect to ourselves. And so I remember doing that a few times and like, you know, ending up with my knees in the dirt, my hands in the dirt and just, you know, because I just missed her so terribly. So, but I think the thing that finally turned it around for me was that I didn't want to cook any of her food and I'd been cooking mm -hmm. a lot. And before this, and I finally went into the kitchen one day and I just started making Spanish rice kind of in this fog and didn't even realize I was doing it until I smelt it. Mm. And then I was like, oh, that's my mama's rice. And that's what really helped me. It was like, I was crying, but I was like, oh, it's actually like in the kitchen that I right. feel her. I feel yeah. her here with me. Yeah. God, that makes so much sense. So um, is that kind of what started to help you in the depths of your grief? Like yes. cooking? Okay. It was, it was cooking and it was where I felt reconnected to her. And, you know, part of the routine for me, for my whole adult life was that I would call her in the morning when I was going to work and call her in the evening when I was going home. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that was really hard. And thankfully I had other people that I started calling. I was just like, okay, I'm sorry, you gotta be my replacement call because I'm like, you know, I have to talk to somebody when I'm in California traffic yeah. in Silicon Valley and I can't talk to my mom anymore. So yeah, that really helped. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Yeah, because you had your routine and your routine was morning mom call, evening mom call, right? And then that's no longer available to you. Wow. So um a lot of people have grief for ever when they lose their mom, you know? And I know grief um, comes in waves, you know? I don't know if it ever really goes away when something so painful happens, you know, maybe the waves get further and further apart, but something can like shake you, like you Mother's Day, <laughs> right? Mother's Day, mm -hmm. it all comes back up. So um, can you offer anything that really helped you even dig deeper and release some of that grief so it doesn't really store in your body? Yes, so um, one of my friends recommended when I was talking to her about what had happened with my mom and all this time that we spent together and cooking, she was the one that said, you know what, you should write a book. Mm. and write a book about this experience. And I was like, why does anybody want to hear about my mother dying? You know, it's a really right. sad thing. And she said, you know what? She goes, it'll help people feel like they're not alone. Like they're not the first yeah. ones that's gone through this. And she goes, and you learn some stuff and maybe it'll help somebody. And I said, you know what? Okay. All right. I'm going to do that. And so I, you know, that's how I met you in our writer's workshop. And 
um, found Carolyn, my editor, and so I started writing a book, and I would get up every morning at 5.30 in the morning, and I would write for an hour before I went to work. And while I sat down, I felt like she was there with me. Hmm. I really felt like she was telling the story with me. And, but a couple of months into this process, I was reading, you know, what I'd written and I was talking to my editor and I was like, you know what, nobody's going to want to read this book. It's like so sad. And it's just, you know, yeah, somebody being sick and being, it's just sad. And so Carolyn suggested, she goes, well, when your mom was so sick, did you talk about like growing up and fun things? And I go, absolutely. Mm -hmm. She goes, right. so add that into the book. And so yeah. I started adding those little stories of, you know, me growing up on a farm and uh, us coming back from Sunday mass and my mother, we had goats and or my mother didn't want any goats. My dad had gotten goats and we came home from Sunday mass and the goats had gotten into my mother's peach trees and they're, they're, they're literally like up in the trees yeah. and my mother's peaches. And my mother had a complete fit and she, here she is in her Sunday dress which she only did on Sundays when we went to church. And she goes and she grabs this gigantic broom and she is swatting goats out of the trees. <laughs> and as a kid, you know, you see these tracks yeah. felt like the goats were flying. So, so Carolyn really helped me. And by doing that, again, that was also a like, oh, that's yes. right. All my time with my mama wasn't bad. Right. And I had just logged into that, like yeah. the, the bad and the bad memories and the pain. And so it really helped shifting. It's really started to shift. And so what I want to say for all of us that for, for you that are listening, it doesn't mean that I'm saying everybody needs to write a book. It's that find something to do with that energy that will yeah. turn something. And for me, it was writing a book, but maybe yeah. for those listening, it might be planting a garden. It might be doing needlework. It might be volunteering someplace but finding some way to have some movement with mm -hmm. what's going on. And I think that really, really helped me. Yeah. I think that you said have some movement because, you know, being and having been in grief myself, you know, it's a very heavy, stagnant energy, right? So I talk about, do you want to talk yeah, about, that, about losing your yeah. grandmother so that, yeah. So, um, I'll share. I'm lucky. I have my mom, you know, um, my mom was really close to my grandmother and I remember her not being able to get out of bed for months. I was only 16 when my grandmother died, but I was super close with my grandmother, Eileen. Um, she was so beautiful. She looked like Ava Gardner when she was young. I mean, she was just gorgeous. So, um, I have a sister who is, um, just about three years younger than me and she was born with uh, special needs and she had a lot of health challenges. So I spent the first few, like well, from three, probably till about six years old, so much time with my grandmother. She was like my second mother. So, because my mom and my dad had to take care of my sister who had so many challenges. So uh, I mean, I, I spent like, we were so, so close and she was just like the most amazing woman ever. And it was devastating when she died, you know, because I imagine that she would be there when I was in my twenties and my thirties and be this old lady. Cause she was only 67 when she passed away. So she was young. Um, and she was just so funny. And we, this morning, my sister and I, and we were telling funny stories about my mom. That's what we called her, my mom. And we were telling all these funny stories about how crazy she was. And, and it, it's nice to be, you know, I mean, it's been so many years now, but to laugh about the funny stories, because she always, she was a terrible cook. <laughs> Talking about your mom was a good cook. She was a terrible cook. She could only make a couple of things really good. One of them was stuffed artichokes, which are my favorite. Um, but she would burn everything. And one time she made a big salad. Uh, we were talking about laughing this morning. And instead of putting um, olive oil, she put, um, what is that? West, 
not the 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 furniture oil like wesson oil is it called wesson oil what's the oil that you clean furniture with murphy's uh, murphy's oil. yeah like murphy's yes because it's the oil. same color and they're under the same <laughs> she almost poisoned my mother oh no <laughs> and she would do stuff like that all the time and my, I'm the oldest of three girls, so when she died, I'm the only one that went with my mom and my father up to the funeral because she lived in New Jersey. And when she would come to Florida, I'm in Florida, she would stay with us for like five months and she would sleep in bed with me. So we would stay up all night and she would sneak cigarettes and she, <laughs> she, was, she was so funny. So we, I felt like, you know, that that feeling, that loss, like I couldn't, like, like, where did she go? Like, why isn't she here? And then, of course, I tried to be strong for my mother because my mother was so young and then she lost her mother, you know, and she was so devastated. So it was, it was definitely a challenge. But what I love now with so many years going by is even though we still miss her terribly, and I know my mom still feels it, especially on Mother's Day, she misses her mom, you know, I mean... And it's been, oh my God, I don't even know how long it's been, wow. 25, 30 years now. Um, we can tell funny stories. And when we tell those funny stories, we do, we feel like she's here. And we get signs from her all the time. Butterflies are a big sign, especially she, she had um, that reddish orange hair that she would dye herself. <laughs> So every time we see the orange, you know, the monarch butterflies and stuff, we always say, oh, my mom's around. For certain songs, we're like, oh, she's saying hi. Yeah, so that's good. That's really good. Thank you for sharing that, Melissa. Well, thanks for asking. You know, my mom, she was, she was a card. <laughs> <laughs> and she was loved like your mom, Rose. I, we've never seen so even the, the people at the funeral parlor said they never saw so many people come out because everybody just adored her. They just loved her. Yeah. That is so beautiful. I know. Yeah. And they're both with us right now. <laughs> I think so. And I, you know, I didn't say that earlier, but that's, I think one of the other things that's really helped me with my grief is that I so know that I'm going to see her again. I do. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really helped. Yeah, it's very comforting, that thought. It is a very comforting thought. Yeah. So you were like working on um, your book and I know that was helping you deal with your grief. Um, I know I was friends, we were friends at this point. So I remember um, when you finished your book. So how did that feel? Yeah, so when I finished my book and uh, my first draft was done and I told my husband that I was done and I started crying. He's like, what is wrong with you? You finished your first draft of your book, aren't you excited? <laughs> and I was like, no, because it's going to end. That connection that I felt with her every day, I knew it was going to be different because we were going to mm -hmm. go into editing it and it was just going to be another shift. And and he, you know, was surprised, but it felt, it felt very, you know, sad to me again, like I'd lost her again. Um, but, but it's shifted since then. And, and it's probably because of the cooking so much in my mm -hmm. weekly podcast. And, you know, now I think it was yesterday, her crunchy, our crunchy taco video on YouTube hit 150,000 views. Wow. And, and it's so cool for me to see people making my mama's tacos in her their kitchens because I'm like, she's living on, you know, she's just living on. She's still spreading her joy with, right. with her good food, and it's you know <laughs> it's making other families happy. And so I think that's what's really where I'm at now. Is it because of you know the the way that her food some people love her food so much it's it's like there's a part of her that is continuing on yeah yeah um, hold it do me a favor hold up your a copy of your book for sure. people to see so and um diana also took the photo <laughs> on the cover which i'm very <laughs> proud of and i see people do good photography <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, so tell them a, a little bit about the mocajete that is on the cover because yeah. that has a story too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the mocajete right here, it's a um, for pester and mortar. I can never say it in English, but basically we use it for smashing garlic, making salsas, cooking with it. And this one specifically was my grandma Magdalena's. And she came into this country illegally from Mexico a very long time ago. And when she walked in with her suitcase, this is one of the things that she had with her. So I feel very blessed and it's here. I think you can see it behind, it's right there behind me. There it is. I use it, I use it all the time in my kitchen. It's still part of it, part of my life. And so I think it has magic in it. And um, one of the things that I, I did never got to meet my grandmother because she passed uh, when my mother was five months pregnant with me. Mm -hmm. And, but my grandmother um, was a really spiritual woman. And she, what she would do is she would actually go into people's homes um, when somebody was dying, they would call for her and she would go in and pray with the person that was dying and to help them have a good death or a peaceful death and be there with the family. So that's who my grandma Magdalena was. And so it's like, I feel very connected to her mm -hmm. um, from writing the book and then having her mocajete. And that's why I felt like it had to be on my mm -hmm. cover. It just yeah. did. Yeah. And I think the way that I was able to be present for my mom when she passed had a lot to do with the stories that my mother would tell me about what she did for her mother. And then, you know, how she took care of her because she was also very sick. And then also the way I saw her take care of my grandpa because my grandfather lived with us for many years before he passed. And my mom just took such good care of him. It was just mm. amazing to see. Yeah. So I had a good mo I had a good model of what, yes. of what to do. It sounds like it. Yeah. 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 And I can, like I said earlier, um, I've had the food that was made in the magical mocha day. <laughs> and it is like, I mean, it, I, I crave your Mexican food. Aww. I can't wait to be able to come back out with you and have some more. It was so good. And her guacamole is like ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to cook for you again, Miss Melissa. <laughs> Just can't wait. So, like, I know you're always still cooking her recipes. So how are you, this is like a two-part question. So how are you dealing with your grief now? Mm -hmm. And how, like, what happens now when you're cooking her recipes? Um, you know what, now there's usually just joy because it's, you know, I'm so grateful that I learned how to make them and I feel like she's around when I'm doing it. I just do. But like when you were here and we were taking photos from my new book and you made her mole look so beautiful because you were taking those photos and I just started bawling. Yeah. Because I felt like, oh my gosh, like she would be so excited about how beautiful Melissa made her food look. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And she's not here. Yeah. Um, so what you were talking about earlier, this this grief, it comes in and goes out. It, it mm -hmm. definitely, it's definitely for me now. There's more joy around it, but definitely moments that I feel I feel it. And yesterday, before I was doing the cooking demo, I teared up. And, and Sean, my husband, was talking to me about it. He's like, "What's wrong?" And I'm like, "You know, if she would have known." Like, mm -hmm. you know, to have her here, to see her, see me making those tacos and just, she'd probably yeah. be telling me to do this and move that around so <laughs> to help people, you know, don't forget to tell them that, don't forget to tell them this. And right. so, so those are, yeah. So you still hear her voice in your head, which is. Oh, funny. absolutely. <laughs> Ab absolutely. And, you know, I always, the guacamole, I don't know what it is, but every time I take a bite and it's especially good, um, mm -hmm. especially the avocados are good, I'm just like, oh, I, you'd want a bite. I know you'd want a bite. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's so good. But, so uh, what's your favorite of hers that you make? So, um, you know what? Her, my favorite, and I haven't perfected this, is her flour tortillas. Okay. Like her um, um, tortillas de harina, oh my God, her tortillas were amazing. 
And because we grew up on a farm, she would make homemade butter. So having oh, wow. homemade butter on a homemade flour tortilla. That sounds. sounds <laughs> so, like, so, and I make her tortillas, but they're still not as good as hers. But that's yeah. the flour tortillas. Yeah, sure. I, I think if you, I mean, you know, I'm Italian, so we're surrounded by food. That's very much a part of our, of our love language. So everybody has their favorite mama's food, like comfort food. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. So you're saying you haven't protected, um, perfected it yet, but that doesn't mean you won't. Maybe you won't. I don't know. Maybe your mom will hold back a little and she's like, oh, no, I'm not going to let my Diana make it as good as me. <laughs> well, I did recently finally post the recipe because I it's it wasn't written down. And with my Tia Trina's uh, help, I was able to get pretty close. And then I was I was trying to make them and I went, oh bacon fat she put bacon fat on them just a little <laughs> bit on the masa and I did it and it came out so they're they're getting better but they're just not yeah yet. but yeah wow well that sounds like I mean it's I mean every like I said everything that you made was just and I know that that was you know that was given from your mother it was delicious so I was like happier than oh my god and for me, it's, for me, it was like another person to feed. Yay. Because <laughs> you know, that's what we want. We want to feed people. Yeah, because uh, when, when you asked me, oh, do you want to come out and you can photograph the recipes for my book and we'll have fun. And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> talking about food. It's awesome. You're food just, and photography, you're, my favorite you're, things. And you're such an amazing photographer. Oh, Thank gosh. you. So... I wanted to ask you if there were any, um, anything else that you want to share or any um, um, tidbits that you think that could really help people that are listening that are, I mean, I'm, there may be some people listening that um, just lost their moms and they're in the most raw part of their grief, like something that you could offer that was helpful to you during that. I think um, to be compassionate with yourselves we yeah. ourselves and just really be in a place of self-love because you know i think especially in the u.s if you lose your a, a parent you go back to work in five days it's right. not long enough right and right. and you might be doing okay and then because this grief cycle something will trigger you and you are back yeah. and it's raw and it hurts is to just be like, this is what I need to get through. And I mean, I think if I would have done that earlier, that would have helped me, but to be very self-compassionate and that mm -hmm. movement, finding something that will help you, I think is, is very important. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, it's something that I still do. I have started it a long time ago. Um, I can't remember where I started this, but there is a meditation called a Abra la puerta, open the door. It's a beautiful meditation. You can find it, I'm sure, on YouTube. And it's just, you have this whole, it walks you through all these things of, and somebody being at your door. And so when I do it, I do it of my mom being at the door. Mm -hmm. And I let her come in and sit next to me and just be very, like, what would she tell me right now at this point in my life? And I know it sounds a little out there, but it really does help. It really helps to make yeah. that space for her. Well, it makes sense that it helps because our subconscious mind doesn't know when we're in a fantasy, right? It feels mm -hmm. like it's real. So if you can tap into that, you are really connecting with your, you know, your mom. I love that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> so um, I wanted to tell people um, if they go to molemama.com, um, they can read all about you. But you be you write a beautiful blog, which I'm not going to read here. People can go on your site and find it. And it's called Connecting with Home Cooking, How My Mother Reci How My Mother's Recipes Help Me Process My Grief. And it's really beautiful. So mm -hmm. I advise people to um, look for it. And um, your YouTube channel. So tell us about your YouTube channel. How are you feeling doing that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's been, it's been an experience for sure. Um, I just launched a new video yesterday at all different types of bean recipes. And now I'm actually editing my own stuff. So that's fun. 
I think the, the, you know, there is some cyber bullying that happens when you have a YouTube channel and that's the scary part, right? Is you get all these comments mm -hmm. of hate, <laughs> but the beautiful thing is to see the people making your recipe, making our recipes, which is just mm -hmm. phenomenal. And yeah, I love it so much and having people reach out to me. And, um, most recently we had, I had somebody that was a special needs young woman. I think she was mm -hmm. in her teens and she made tacos for her whole family and she did a video of it. And oh, I got to see her that. making tacos and it was just, I'm like, oh, my mother would love this. I loved it so much because yeah. they are so easy to make. Anybody can make them. So it's just lovely. Yeah. So, but Melissa, I wanted to give some time because I know we're getting short on time. So mm -hmm. we can talk about your amazing, oh, your, your you. book. If you can tell people about your book and then we can get into our, our little art project. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, like I said in the beginning, I'm Melissa Caprio. I'm a photographer and an author, and I'm going to hold up a picture in my book because I brought it here too. <laughs> So you can see it's called Postcards to the Universe, a Global Movement for Manifestation. So just to share a little bit about the book. So um, I ask people to create a manifesting postcard. And basically what a manifesting postcard is, it's kind of like, I know most people are familiar with vision boards. It's like if you want to bring something into your life, you create a vision board and you cut out photos or you, or you, you know, print them out of things that you want to bring into your life. So I ask people to create sort of like little mini vision boards <laughs> and uh, about maybe like pick one subject of something you want to bring into your life and then send it to me. I photograph it. And when your manifestation becomes a reality, we share your story. So there's 30 stories in the book. One is mine, and that's about getting a publishing contract, which was a really big deal. And of course, Diana, and I'm going to look, is where you are, is in my book also. So I don't know how good it's going to look on Zoom, but oh. I will try. But here's Diana's postcard. Yeah, and then um, I borrowed a neighbor's uh, mocajete, <laughs> so I put it in there with some roses because the book was inspired by your mother, Rose, and her story is called Cooking is My Love Language, which is so beautiful. So that's what my book is about. I also have a podcast called Postcards to the Universe with Melissa, and um and I have a weekly radio show with the same name on One Two Radio, which is online radio. But I take the shows from the radio and bring it to my podcast. So that could be listened to anytime. And you can find me at postcards to the universe.com. And if you have any questions, you can, anybody, I'm always open to helping people create a manifesting postcard. So just reach out to me. Yes. And I love that you showed my postcard and they couldn't see how poor my art is, <laughs> my artwork is, <laughs> but it really, really works. Um, I think it does. I always hear that when you put your intentions out there. And yeah. so do you have any thoughts for anyone that might be thinking about doing a postcard for today? Yes. Yeah. So a lot of people think, okay, I have to make a postcard about something I want, whether it's a new relationship or, you know, a new car, a new house, a new job, a new this, a vacation, you know, all the joyful stuff. But I've had a lot of people send me postcards about things that they've wanted to let go of, whether it be a relationship, a feeling, weight, you know, so... There, I was thinking when we were talking about doing that, like um, about asking if people would be interested if they want and they feel comfortable about creating a postcard that could either be a love letter to their mother. Mm -hmm. So you could, um, it's really simple to do. Um, you could um, just sit down, create a space, make it a sacred space, maybe light a candle or have some fa of your mom's favorite things around you. Um, make sure you shut your phone off and nobody disturbs you. And if you have kids, you lock the door because <laughs> everybody's home together, you know, and make it a really beautiful space and then sit down and um, put your heart into your postcard and kind of 
what you'd be doing is you would send it to me, which you can find the address on my website. And you're sort of sending it to the universe and your mama, you know, and I can photograph it. You can let me know it's coming. We could do a story on it uh, if you feel comfortable. Um, I always ask people to take a photo of their postcard, you know, when they complete it and put it on um, a place that they can see it all the time, maybe their refrigerator, their bathroom mirror, you know, something that just brings you a little bit of comfort and peace. And then the physical postcard to actually release, I mean, that's one idea that I had. If you're stuck in grief, and it's been a long time and you feel like that maybe you're not moving the grief and you're having a really hard time letting it go and you wanna let the grief go, you could do a postcard around letting go of grief and anything that represents that grief to you. And just when your intention is when you set it free and you mail it is I'm letting this grief go, you know? So there's a couple of options if people wanna take that opportunity and you could always find me on, on my uh, website, postcards to the universe.com and you can email me and we can talk about it a little bit more if people have questions about what they wanna do. But those were the two ideas that I was thinking. So that's beautiful. So basically they just get a, a postcard and mm -hmm. you're saying, and can it, they just draw? Or can they, they can draw, they can paint, they can go on Pinterest and print out images that resonate with you know if your mother's favorite thing was um like today we're talking about food a certain dish that she loved you that could be on your postcard if it was a favorite city that she loved you know you could do it any way you want there are no rules and what i like is being very open and not telling people too much what to do people tap into their creativity and and I really think it's important to create the space because I think that it's going to really help people connect with their moms, you know, where you're feeling, you know, talk to your mom when you're making the postcard, connect with her, you know, create that space because that's really what it's about. I mean, the postcard is the visual representation of it, but it's really about that energy of being in that energy. And that's where the power lies. Now I'm not a creative person and I, and I remember when you asked me to do this and I was like, ah, oh, and I was starting while my mama and I was like, oh God, I can't draw. <laughs> um, so I'm just saying, I'm sharing that because it doesn't really matter. You're, it's mm -hmm. not, it's, it's really like you said, it's about the energy mm -hmm. and you putting it on paper. And I can say that almost everything that I put on mine has all happened, which is amazing. Right. Which is amazing. Uh, but on the other side of the postcard, you also have us write stuff out. So we were writing mm -hmm. stuff out, which was nice too. Yeah, so you could write an F and you some kind of a statement that um, I'm finally able to release my grief now. You know, whatever statement resonates with you or, you know, it could be as simple as, hi mom, I miss you and I'm so happy to be connecting with you again. You know, if it's right. a love letter to your mom, whatever you want to write. Right. But like I said, there's no wrong answers here. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. right. So, or, you know, I, I really think that sometimes our grief stays with us forever, but it's yeah. maybe it's, you know, I'm really looking forward to having fewer bad days. Right. With my grief. Yeah. And somehow growing an extra heart is it, because that's how I feel. I feel like I've mm -hmm. kind of, grown something in me that holds that space for yeah. that sadness but I mean just anything but Melissa that that I love your movement and I love your Thank book your you. book is amazing um there's so much wisdom in there and so many helpful tips for everyone so thank, thank you yeah. so much for sharing that with everybody and I put the um the your web address on there so they know how to get in touch with you and where to mail the postcard to if they decide to do one and i know that we only have a few minutes left today mm -hmm. um i would love for those of us that are still here if you could if you feel comfortable with putting your mother's name in the chat room mm. and then if you have any questions for us um and I, 
So let, why don't we give people a minute to think about if they want to do that, first of all. Yeah. Put your oh. mama's name. Okay. Yeah, put, I'm going to put, put mine. I'm going to put my grandmother's name in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to, or you have any questions, especially for Diana, please Thank feel you. free. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> Oh, I love that. I love that too, Louie. That's so sweet. <laughs> Mary Lou. I called her oh. Louie. I know. I love that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very sweet. Mm -hmm. So I imagine a lot of people today, you know, when they get off the call, you know, Mother's Day is not over. So is there any like words of wisdom you want to leave people with like today, you know, while people are thinking if they want to ask a question or not, or share their mom's name um, that you can share with those who are listening, you know, to help us get through the rest of today. I would say do one thing where she would be like, that's a really good thing for you or something that's going to bring you some joy. One thing. And I know that a lot of us are locked in right now. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, the one thing that I'm going to do today is I'm going to have ice cream. <laughs> so I love ice cream. <laughs> and that was part of our tradition is that on Sundays, because we were out on the farm, we would drive, we would drive into town and would go to Savon's and get ice cream. <laughs> so that's something that I'm going to do today. But yeah. while people are also waiting, um, I just wanted to, for a moment, to just say a quick prayer. Okay. So I would just like to call upon spirit, universe, God, whatever name that you call a higher being, to be with you today, to bring you some peace, to bring you grace, and to bring you a knowing that you are not alone, that you will see your mother again, that she is with you always, and that you will feel her love again. And you can tap into it anytime you want by remembering a joyful memory. And be well, everyone. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful.